Dear colleagues, dear friends, greetings and welcome to our webinar series on the topic of hypertension and atrial fibrillation. Both hypertension and atrial fibrillation are associated with worse outcomes, predominantly stroke and death. And the combination of atrial fibrillation and hypertension is associated with an even higher risk. And recent evidence has shown that the presence of other comorbidities further increase these risks. These other comorbidities that we talk about include chronic kidney disease, COPD, diabetes, and obstructive sleep apnea. And finally, the presence of atrial fibrillation after treatment further increases risk of stroke and death. In the coming period, each month, one of these topics will be broadcasted. Each session will be tailored to address the latest developments, the best practices and emerging trends in each of these areas. Our expert speakers will also provide practical insights and case studies to help you apply this information in your clinical practice. Finally, on the 18th of October, a Meet the Experts session will give you the opportunity to interact with these experts. Questions for the faculty can be sent in through academy at omron.com. Please send your questions for these experts. Let's go back to today. So during today's webinar, we will have three topics presented to you by three renowned speakers. Meet the partners, hypertension and atrial fibrillation, presented by myself, atrial fibrillation and hypertension, a predestined match by Professor Natasha de Groot. We encourage your active participation and engagement in this exciting educational opportunity. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to your continued involvement in this series. For now, let's start. Let's start with today's session, hypertension and atrial fibrillation, a risky couple, even more when the family expands. I will introduce to you the concept of hypertension and atrial fibrillation and their interaction. Hypertension, the most important modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. It's the leading cause of mortality in Europe, stroke, end-stage renal, and peripheral vascular disease. If you diagnose hypertension, you can alter outcomes. What is actually the definition of hypertension? Well, normal blood pressures. Is systolic lower than 120 millimeters mercury? And diastolic? lower than 80 millimeters mercury. Prehypertension situation is when systolic blood pressure is between 120 and 140 millimeters mercury and the diastolic is between 80 and 89. Stage 1 hypertension is a systolic pressure between 140 and 160 and a diastolic pressure between 90 and 100. Stage 2, when the risk increases, is 160 millimeters or more and diastolic 100 millimeters or more. Hypertension facts that you should know. The most common primary diagnosis worldwide is hypertension, the number one risk factor for global health and a major risk factor for stroke, myocardial infarction, vascular disease and chronic kidney disease. What you should also know is that the worldwide prevalence of hypertension in adults is around 30 to 45 percent. That's not trivial. The prevalence of hypertension in Europe ranges from 9 to 20 percent in the adults. 9 to 20 percent. And it ranges from 44 to 60 in the elderly. Almost 60 percent in the elderly. So most important is awareness. And if we ask people, it appears that only 50 percent of individuals realize that they have hypertension, 50% only. And despite intensive medical therapy and guidelines, you see here the period from 1999 to 2016, over that period with new guidelines and intensive medical therapy and new developments in medical therapy, there is no reduction in prevalence. You see a flat curve. That means that over the years, nothing has changed. And with the increasing aging population, what we see nowadays comes an increase 
in hypertension prevalence. If you look at these bars here, I'm just going to ask you to look at the light greens. And that's 60 years and over. And I put the circles for you there. So 63% in the total, 60, almost 58.5% in men, and 668 in women have hypertension. That's not trivial. That's huge. Hypertension is also associated with worse outcomes if you don't treat it or when it's uncontrolled. And these are these two. You see here the highest event rate is in the patients that are left untreated or uncontrolled hypertension. There is a relation between hypertension and atrial fibrillation. Long-standing hypertension results in aortic stiffness. Aortic stiffness then results in left ventricular hypertrophy and increased left ventricular and diastolic pressure. And these two, left ventricular hypertrophy and increased end diastolic pressure, results in LA dilatation, and with that comes atrial fibrillation. Here you see the prevalence of new onset AF in hypertension. And even if it's in red, intensive treatment, or it's in blue, standard treatment, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is exactly the same. So treatment has some effect, but not as much as we want. We need to be aware. We need to increase awareness. AF occurs frequently in hypertension, and with that comes a high risk of stroke. Now I come to the point. We can change things. We can change. And early home detection enables identification of patients with AFib or proximal AFib and permits earlier treatment of AFib by anticoagulating them and possibly preventing disabling events. We can do something as long as we realize and we create awareness and we can detect. My conclusions are simple. Hypertension is prevalent. It's associated with increased mortality. Hypertension is associated with cardiovascular disease and stroke. Hypertension is associated with atrial fibrillation. Early detection of hypertension atrial fibrillation permits early treatment. And if you treat the patient early and the patient is aware, we together can prevent adverse events. Well, thank you very much. And it's my great pleasure to introduce now to you Professor Natasha de Groot. She comes from the Erasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and she will address an important question, atrial fibrillation and hypertension, a predestined match. <laughs> Atrial fibrillation has for the first time already been described in 1815. In 1904, it was recognized that atrial fibrillation is a specific arrhythmia. And then in 1906, the first surface electrocardiogram of atrial fibrillation was recorded. Atrial fibrillation is regarded as the cardiovascular epidemic of the 21st century. It has been estimated that around 2015, nearly 6 million people in the United States will have atrial fibrillation. And if you have reached an age of 80 years or older, nearly 50% of the patients will have atrial fibrillation. If we take a look at the worldwide population, at this moment 0.5% of the population has atrial fibrillation. That's about 37 million cases. And that's only the patients who are, are, are symptomatic. And we don't have any clue about the patients who are asymptomatic. Atrial fibrillation is regarded as the final common pathway of both cardiac diseases, but also non-cardiac diseases. This table is derived from the guidelines of the ESC. And here we can see the risk factors for atrial fibrillation. And there are a variety of risk factors, both associated with the cardiac diseases, but also with non-cardiac diseases like pulmonary diseases or renal diseases. But then it also says hypertension is a risk factor and also borderline hypertension, and it's the most significant risk factor for atrial fibrillation. <laughs> 
Atrial fibrillation can potentially be curatively treated by a so-called pulmonary vein isolation. And this therapy is based on the discovery of Michel Hasegger around the 90s, where they saw that episodes of atrial fibrillation could be triggered by, the, by tissue within the pulmonary veins. And we nowadays treat atrial fibrillation by isolating the pulmonary veins, so isolating the triggers. But that's often not enough. And there's now an upcoming concept of the integrated AF management, in which we also manage the cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension. And we know that if we do the management most optimal, it will also improve the outcome of ablative therapy. But what is the relation between hypertension and atrial fibrillation? First, we can take a look at the epidemiological studies. And here we see a table derived from a survey performed in nine countries in Europe, where we can see that hypertension is the most common comorbidity in the patients with a variety of atrial fibrillation, so the variable types ranging from paroxysmal to persistent and also long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. In another study performed in Norway, where they had a follow-up of over 2,000 healthy men, they compared the baseline systolic and diastolic blood pressure with a long-term outcome. And in this study, they demonstrated that not only hypertension, but also blood pressure values within the range of the upper normal blood pressures is a long-term predictor of incident atrial fibrillation in healthy middle-aged men who were initially without atrial fibrillation. And here we see another study where they demonstrated that if there is an optimal blood pressure control, it might even decrease the burden of atrial fibrillation in hypertensive patients. So if we summarize all these studies, we can see that hypertension is an independent risk factor for incident atrial fibrillation, progression of atrial fibrillation, AF-related stroke, and AF-related mortality. But why is that? Well, first have to take a look into the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation. Here we see the surface EKG of atrial fibrillation, and we all know that the surface EKG of atrial fibrillation is is, can be identified by a B2B change in the P-wave morphology and also in the irregular RR intervals. And this is what you see when you record potentials directed directly from the surface of the heart. So you see a continuous electrical activation and very chaotic. But this is what you have on the outpatient clinic. You have your individual patient with hypertension and atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation in these patients is quite variable. They vary in the duration, the number of AF episodes, their triggers, the way they terminate. And on top of that, it also changes over time. We know that atrial fibrillation initially starts as a trigger-driven arrhythmia, but over time, when it transitions from the paroxysmal to the more permanent types of atrial fibrillation, it is more, becomes more a substrate-driven arrhythmia. And here you can see what happens. When you measure, for example, during cardiac surgery, when you make an incision in the atria, and you put two electrodes on the inner and outer layer of the heart, and your record electrical activity, you would expect that in a thin-walled atrium of only two millimeter, that there is one large wavefront during sinus rhythm propagating through the atria. And that is what we see here. You see uh, in color-coded uh, patterns of activation. You can follow the colors of the rainbow. You see the arrow. And if you just take a piece of atrial tissue, you see the smooth propagation. And when you record potentials from both the endo and the AP carnament, it looks the same. And this is during sinus rhythm. But this is obtained from a patient with proximal atrial fibrillation who had as a risk factor atrial fibrillation. And what we see here is that you can again see the patterns of activation in the colors, and you only have to take a look at the colors, and you see that the color maps on both the endo and the AP cardium are roughly the same. And also the signals recorded from the AP and the endocardium, which you see on the right part of the slide, they are roughly the same. But if atrial fibrillation becomes more complex, and that is what you see in this slide, so here you see activation maps and signals obtained from a patient with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, you can already see by just comparing the colors that the colors are different. 
So the inner and the outer layer of the heart are not simultaneously activated. And that makes atrial fibrillation very complex. And when you take a look at the signals derived from the endo and the apicardia, you see also that they are quite different. So the endo and the apicardium during long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation become electrically dissociated. And that is important, because if you have a patient in front of you, a child patient clinic who has hypertension, untreated hypertension, and has already progressed from paroxysmal to the long-standing persistent types of atrial fibrillation, it means that every minute 8,000 waves are propagating from one layer to the other. And that is a novel mechanism from AF that has recently been discovered. But it is very important because it indicates that when atrial fibrillation becomes too complex, you can also not treat it very well. And what is then the mechanistic interplay between atrial fibrillation and hypertension? We know that triggers and the substrate both play an important role in the development of atrial fibrillation. But how does hypertension influence those two factors. First, you have the triggers. It is known, if you take a look at the literature, that a higher incidence of supraventricular ectopy is related to the development of atrial fibrillation. Supraventricular ectopy occurs frequently in patients with hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy. And if you put these patients on an exercise test, you can see that during the recovery phase, there might be an increase in the supraventricular ectopy. And it, there has been a study where they followed patients after exercise testing for over 40 months, and they showed that the higher incidence of supraventricular ectopy during the recovery phase of the exercise testing was associated with the development of atrial fibrillation during long-term follow-up. But what is exactly the mechanism interplay between those two phenomena. And this is what is summarized on this slide. So in the end, you have the atrial arrhythmias, that's atrial fibrillation, and you see that hypertension is associated with atrial fibrillation via various pathways. So hypertension influences sympathetic activity, and the sympathetic activity influences your dispersion of your activ electrical activity, which contributes to more complex patterns of activation. You may have inflammation, and inflammation influences the structure of the myocardium. And then you have left atrial stress, you're, when you have left atrial dilatation. They all promote uh, the development of fibrosis. Fibrosis induces structural remodeling. Structural remodeling gives rise to electrical remodeling, and that provides the substrate for the development of atrial fibrillation. And then on top of that, you also have a lot of genetic factors influencing the development of atrial fibrillation. At the end of my presentation, I would like to provide you with some food for thought. When you take a look at the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation and hypertension, it is usually said that hypertension induces fibrosis, fibrotic tissue in the atria induces conduction abnormalities, the conduction abnormalities contain the substrate for atrial fibrillation, and with the, the grow of the substrate, you develop atrial fibrillation. But that's actually not completely the case. Fibrosis is not the only factor related to structural remodeling. There are many factors which relate to the structural remodeling, like for example, the protein proteostasis is an important factor in the development of atrial fibrillation. Fibrosis is not related to conduction abnormalities. Conduction abnormalities may also be caused by other abnormalities or even physiological uh, properties of the atrial tissue. And not all conduction abnormalities give rise to atrial fibrillation. So the relation fibrosis caused by hypertension leads to conduction abnormalities and then atrial fibrillation, I think, is much more complex. Then here are the take-home messages. So atrial fibrillation is the most frequent arrhythmia in hypertension patients. Hypertension is the most prevalent comorbidity in patients with atrial fibrillation. Hypertension induces atrial fibrillation by influencing the degree of atrial ectopy. 
and it also affects the atrial substrate. But how exactly is not yet known. Regulation of the blood pressure reduces the burden of atrial fibrillation, and regulation of blood pressure also improves ablation outcome. But again, the mechanism how hypertension results in the development of atrial fibrillation is still unknown. I would like to thank you for your attention. Well, Natasha, phenomenal lecture, as always. Very didactic and emphasizing a lot of important issues in the disease of atrial fibrillation. It's not just a simple disease, what we learned from your uh, presentation. I got several questions for you. Yeah. So the first one, does hypertension, as you hinted, and I discussed a little bit about, does hypertension affect the success of AFib ablation in your practice? How do you deal with it? Uh, yes, I do think that uh, the presence of hypertension affects the ablation outcomes. If you have a recurrence after uh, pulmonary vein isolation, it can be simply because you have a gap in the lesion, and that's why you develop a uh, recurrent AF. But we often see that when patients come in for a redo procedure, the pulmonary veins are isolated. Right. So that means that atrial fibrillation has already progressed to the substrate mediate arrhythmia. Um, and then you don't know exactly where the substrate is. So if you have hypertension for a very long time, the degree of structural remodeling is likely to be higher. And that might explain that you have more recurrences if you have an advanced stage of hypertension. So yes, I think it does influence the outcome of your ablation procedure. So when we see hypertension in whatever patient, we have to treat aggressively, You have right? to treat it aggressively, yes. Because uh, what percentage do you think of the patients with hypertension eventually develop atrial fibrillation? Just a guess. Well, if you just take a look at, at the worldwide literature, uh, if it comes to outcome of uh, uh, pulmonary vein isolations, and that's usually they don't have any other comorbidities, but mainly it's, it's hypertension. Mm -hmm. um, then you, if you have paroxysmal AF, true paroxysmal AF episode, it might be around 80%. But if you already have more persistent AF episodes, you require cardioversion, then you go already down to 60 to even 50%, and perhaps even lower if you have, for example, long-standing AF. So that's a very important issue, what we're discussing here. Yes. You need to treat early. Yeah. You cannot wait too long. Yeah. Okay, another question that I have coming in is a little bit linked to that. So longer existing AF, is it still worthwhile to ablate? Um, what are the results in longer existing AF? What, give us some of your insights and, and tell us when we should refer maybe. Um, yeah, the paroxysmal AF, the therapy is clear. You need to, to isolate the pulmonary veins. When it comes to uh, persistent AF, it becomes less clear. And if you take a look from, from like 20 years ago up till now, many different approaches have been developed. We have had ablation of complex signals. We create additional lesions. We create mitral line it lines. Cave tricuspid is line e lesions. Large lesions in the right atrium. But none of those approaches so far increase the outcome. Um, so... Yeah, we are trying, and, and every, every month a new approach comes up in literature, and we try that again, so we're struggling with it. Um, so I think it's still, because you still, you don't, we don't know in front which patient is going to benefit from, from pulmonary vein isolation. So it, it still remains a little bit trial or error. Uh, sometimes you see patients with long-standing persistent AF, you do an ablation procedure, and then you have to cardiovert the patient, the patient goes home, and surprisingly, he's like six months without AF. And then the patient is very happy. Wow. So, yeah, <laughs> you need to... Uh, it, we cannot give a clear answer yet, because we need to learn which patient still benefits for a, pulmonary, for a pulmonary vein isolation or even additional approaches. So that's an ongoing process. I have another question also coming. So that question says, if you have... What is easier to ablate? when LV's LA size has increased or when LA function has deteriorated? Or can you not discriminate it so easily? 
No, I think the, the latter is the case. Uh, interestingly, um, because of the time I left it out, I had a slide of a patient with an Epstein, and the Morbus Epstein, where he had a huge atrium. There was no doubt that that was a dilated atrium. And when you take a look at the patterns of activation, it was so smooth conduction, no conduction abnormalities at all. So the patient, suppose it was the left atrium, and we would have said, oh no, we're not going to ablate it. Well, actually, the conduction was beautiful, and you could have been very successful with your pulmonary vein isolation. So the relation between dilatation uh, and, and conduction abnormalities in AF is also not quite understood. But if function goes down? If function goes down, um, yeah, you also have remodeling of your ventricles, and that is recently discovered that there is also electropathology in your ventricles. I would definitely go for an ablation, because that means that yeah, it can only go worse. Thank you so much. First, a great lecture, and you give us a lot of information to think about. But what is clear to me is that we have to think about early treatment. Yes, early it's most detection important. Yeah. And, and early, early treatment. treatment. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Professor Angela Maas is a clinical cardiologist and on a personal basis a very good friend since more than 30 years. And she has developed a main interest in heart disease in women over the past decades. She focuses on the early identification of women at increased cardiovascular risk and symptom evaluation in women at middle age. Please, Professor Maas, dear Angela, share with us your presentation about hypertension in women and the risks, especially for those over the age of 50 years old. Thank you. Look forward to your presentation. Okay. Thank you, Jeroen, for uh, having me here. Well, hypertension in women is uh, the most deadly uh, cardiovascular risk factor and risk factor uh, uh, of all other risk factors globally. Here you see uh, uh, a slide, quite recent slide from uh, uh, two years ago. You, you can see that high blood pressure is the major deadly cardiovascular risk factor in women. And we know that there are many differences uh, in the way um, blood pressure uh, behaves during lifetime. Um, in general, you can say that below the age of 50, uh, blood pressure is uh, higher in men compared to women. The men are the blue lines and the, um, uh, the red lines, uh, the purple lines are women. And you can see that uh, after the age of uh, 60 here, that systolic blood pressure rises more steeply in women compared to men. And the decline in diastolic blood pressure is about from the mid 50s uh, downwards uh, because of the, uh, the stiffness of the blood vessels, um, that there is a, a greater pulse uh, pressure. So at younger age, uh, women more often have uh, high blood pressure. At older age, uh, it's more common in uh, women. And there are there is some role of uh, menopause in the rise in blood pressure in women, uh, not necessarily in every woman. We know that uh, the panel on the left that estrogens are important uh, in the downregulation of the renin angiotensin uh, system, and when estrogen levels uh, decline uh, towards the age of menopause you can see that blood pressure rises, there's more inflammation, um, uh, myocardial uh, hypertrophy starts to develop, uh, and the risk uh, profile uh, of women uh, has a more adverse uh, profile. And on the right side of this slide, you can see that uh, uh, specifically a younger age of menopause below the age of 40, uh, but also women having more uh, uh, vascular uh, vasomotor symptoms during menopause transition, that uh, these women uh, have a, a higher risk uh, that um, uh, menopause uh, also um, uh, enhances um, uh, the rise in blood pressure. So uh, if, if there is a more symptomatic menopause with a lot of symptoms that may be uh, uh, also related to uh, uh, a faster rise in blood pressure. 
And it's often said that you don't feel hypertension. Well, this may be true for elderly people above 80 with very stiff blood vessels and a long-standing um, history of hypertension. But specifically in women entering menopause, women passing their 50s, uh, hypertension may provoke a lot of symptoms. Think of fatigue, chest pain, pain between the shoulder uh, blades, but also atrial fibrillation, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and uh, extra uh, systoles, uh, sweating, hot flushes. And often in those women, all these symptoms are attributed to menopause itself, whereas it may be a good reason to check uh, blood pressure more frequently. And as I said uh, at the start of this talk, uh, the most deadly risk factor is hypertension in women. And we also know that hypertension is the most important cause to have atrial fibrillation. So this is a very uh, important uh, connection uh, also in women. And um, Eva Gertz has chaired a very nice uh, position paper last December in the European Heart uh, Journal about sex differences in uh, the development of hypertension. And it's important to notice that uh, specifically in women, uh, on, on, the, on the long run, there uh, is more uh, vascular stiffness compared to men. There is also more development of myocardial stiffness, half path, and also more uh, changes in the microvasculature uh, with increased uh, microvascular coronary resistance. These are important uh, sex differences uh, that occur in vascular and myocardial aging and also lead to more symptoms, specifically in elderly women. Uh, think of disciplinary symptoms in women above the age of uh, 70. And we know that about half of um, uh, heart failure in women is half path and chronic inflammation, for instance, related to obesity or diabetes uh, or even hypertension is involved in this process. And this is also connected, again, to microvascular dysfunction. So these are all uh, um, closely connected uh, syndromes. Uh, and when we think about prevention, uh, it means that we have to start early uh, with uh, checking blood pressure uh, in women uh, at middle age. And there's an important uh, pattern uh, in, in remodeling of the, the left ventricle with aging. In women, uh, hypertrophy dominates over dilatation. In men, we see more often and more early uh, um, dilatation of the left ventricle. And many factors are involved. Again, the risk factors, as just uh, mentioned, but also comorbidities, inflammatory comorbidities that we see more often in women. We um, call this uh, risk variables, uh, but also sex-specific gene expression uh, with uh, aging uh, in the myocardium and uh, blood vessels. And then there are also some differences in, in dominance of risk factors. It is important in women also to, uh, to bear in mind that one out of seven nowadays uh, um, women uh, has breast cancer. And often those women uh, get uh, chemotherapy that may induce early myocardial damage, but even also late myocardial damage about 20 years after initiation of treatment. Women may also have subclinical and clinical peripartum cardiomyopathies that are not always uh, diagnosed. And in men, other um, uh, risk factors may dominate more compared to women. But of course, there, is, uh, there are also many common risk factors, but uh, we have to take notice that uh, there are differences in, in accents uh, of risk factors among men 
and women. Uh, we published uh, two years ago uh, an article with uh, endocrinologist and gyno uh, uh, gynecologist about female specific risk factors and the impact uh, of those in uh, cardiovascular um, uh, aging in uh, women. And one important risk factor related to hypertension and the development of atrial fibrillation uh, are related to hypertension in uh, pregnancy. Uh, about um, 12 to 15 percent of women will have uh, high blood pressure in pregnancy. About three to five percent uh, uh, of those women uh, of women uh, have severe hypertension in pregnancy, preeclampsia or a HELP syndrome. And those are the women that uh, start having hypertension at an earlier age. We showed years ago that about 40% of women after uh, preeclampsia already have elevated blood pressure around the age of 40. And this is not the age that women go to their uh, GPs to check for their blood pressure. It's not in the guidelines, but these are certainly high-risk women uh, to develop premature hypertension and also premature uh, vascular aging. In women, there are still, of course, also in men, but specifically also in women, there are many barriers for, uh, for treatment. Uh, in general, we still know that the socioeconomic position of women is less favorable uh, compared to men. And we know also from data from the US that a low, lower socioeconomic uh, status is associated with uh, a fewer uh, preventive me uh, measures. There are, of course, also um, patient barriers related to education level. This also accounts for men, but in general, uh, uh, also single mom households. Uh, the mothers may be at increased risk for uh, health care uh, problems. And then, um, of course, there are barriers uh, in the healthcare system itself. And one of those is clinical inertia. We, we, we tend to get used to high blood pressure. And, well, we see so many uh, patients with elevated blood pressure that we may be uh, not alert uh, every day uh, to treat them as, as we should do. And of course, there are barriers in the system, expenses um, uh, of medication, uh, etc. Uh, and I'd like to end with uh, a very high uh, risk woman. This was a woman of uh, age 41 uh, who I saw a few years ago at my outpatient clinic. Um, she had migraines since uh, her teens. Uh, hypertension from 20 years onwards, three times a miscarriage, gestational hypertension. Uh, she smoked for several years and at both sides of her family, she had premature hypertension. And you can see at the age of uh, 41 that her blood pressure was really too high for, for her age, but she wasn't treated for that. We did a coronary calcium score because she had symptoms of chest pain, and we find, found a very high calcium score of more than 200 at the age of 41. So premature hypertension in high-risk women may lead to premature vascular aging, and these are the high-risk women that we as uh, medical um, uh, um, experts have to take care uh, 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 very early onwards. So um, patients themselves can also be very helpful by uh, measuring blood pressure themselves. We are doing now a project in women with microvascular angina, and many of them also have hypertension, self-measurement of blood pressure, also, nighttime um, uh, uh, changes in blood pressure may be an early sign of uh, 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 onset of hypertension. And there are nowadays many modalities, modalities that we can use. And we've seen that women are very willing to contribute to their own health. So 
in that aspect, uh, women are quite easy patients. It may, may be more difficult when you, you try to treat them, uh, them with medication. But for self-measurement, uh, they are very co uh, cooperative um, in practice. So to conclude with, um, when we consider high blood pressure and atrial fibrillation and end organ damage, um, such as uh, HEFPEF, and of course, uh, symptoms like atrial fibrillation, we have to take the different life course of men and women into account. So after the age uh, of 60, hypertension is more important, systolic hypertension in uh, women, um, a, a prior history of hypertensive pregnancy disorders is important, the onset of menopause is important, uh, and also other factors, uh, um, atrial fibrillation with aging, etc. And there are certain differences among women and men in the life course. So there are many similarities, but also differences. And I think in this area of patient-tailored um, uh, cardiology, we need to check for those differences because it may, may be... Uh, the patients may benefit uh, from that. Thank you. Well, that was a great lecture, Angela, really fantastic. And it shows us, it teaches us that in women, there is a lot of attention needed for personalized medicine. You made that very, very clear. So I got two questions for you. The first one is, are there certain risks certain risk groups of women that have a higher risk for premature hypertension. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Can you say, okay, these are the ones as a clinician you got to watch? Yeah. Well, I, I showed it a bit in, my, uh, in, in one of my last uh, slides. The women uh, who start uh, in their teens with uh, frequent migraines, we know that premenopausal migraine is associated with uh, earlier hypertension and cardiovascular uh, disease. This is different from postmenopausal migraine, which, which doesn't seem to be related to a higher cardiovascular risk. And those women who have uh, frequent uh, miscarriages uh, from two times miscarriages, you do have a higher risk to develop hypertension. Of course, hypertensive pregnancies are at increased risk. So the life course is very important. And this is not only something for gynecologists to look at, but we as cardiologists, we should check for this. And uh, these are some very simple questions, uh, but very important for the patients. And just an in-between, you highlight again the multidisciplinary approach. We as yeah. physicians, yeah. as specialists, we have to connect more with each other than we used to do in the past, correct? Yeah, yeah. I think innovation in healthcare uh, nowadays is at the crossroads of the different disciplines. I think that's the most uh, important because, you know, when you look at the, at the patient life course, uh, the patient will, will, will have several health problems that may be related to, uh, to each other within different uh, medical disciplines. Right the multidisciplinary approach as we talk yeah. about so often. So another question that comes up is what is the role of self-measurement blood pressure in current practice? Can you advise us about that? How do we implement that? How do we bring that to our patients? What is the role of self-measurements? Yeah, well, uh, we showed in a recent uh, publication, um, uh, we did uh, a study in uh, 200 uh, women after a prior preeclampsia, and we randomized them in, in two uh, uh, groups. 100 women had usual care, and 100 uh, uh, women we asked to measure their blood pressure uh, every month uh, during seven days uh, a week. And these were women uh, at the age of around 45 um, in general, 
And we saw that um, we excluded women already known with hypertension. And we saw that women who measured their blood pressure themselves, that 25% um, uh, of those women detected having uh, elevated blood pressure within a year time. So patients can be helpful to their GPs or other doctors to, uh, to identify their uh, hypertension. Um, and uh, we saw that uh, it was feasible to do so. We also saw that seven days uh, a month may be a bit uh, much on the long run, but women stayed uh, motivated to check their blood pressure at least a few days every month. So patients can be very helpful to their doctor uh, to bring the appropriate diagnosis. I think that's a really important message that you put forward there, that you engage the patients to also partially yes. take responsibility for their health care. But not only that, it shows also that just one blood pressure measurement is really not what you need. What you need is this big scala over the day. How does it... Yeah oscillate, how, how, where is the high level of blood pressures, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It gives us so much more information. And again, self-engagement for the patient is important. Take your responsibility for your own health. Yeah. Angela, fantastic presentation. Let me thank you very much. And um, it was a great show. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Natasha and Angela. That was a Great, great presentations. We saw at the reactions that the audience loved it too. But there are also some more questions that I got in here. So the first one that I receive now is, do you recommend rhythm or rate control for atrial fibrillation and hypertensive patients without heart failure? It's a complex one. A complex question. Um, well, for atrial fibrillation, as I explained, it's a self-perpetuating arrhythmia. So for that reason, I would also always choose for rhythm control. Because if you do rate control, you know that the atria will get damaged and it will be more difficult if a patient, for example, develops heart failure on the end, then, then you cannot do anything anymore. If it comes to rhythm control, we at this present only have one potential cure to treatment modality, and that is, like I explained, pulmonary vein isolation. Uh, that's uh, according to the guidelines now, class one indication. And if you want to give antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, yeah, it, it's more like for the selection which drug to choose. It more depends on the comorbidity of the patients, but also on the age of the patient. Like Cordarone is the most effective drug, but mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't want to give that to a patient of 30 years old. Right. So it's a little bit of a balance. And the class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs are very effective as they prolong the reflectory period, like Sotolol, Namiodarona. Flaconite is also a good alternative. So, yeah. But still, I would go for rhythm control uh, and not rate control. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, does the prescription of anti-specific and hypertension medication bearing on the subsequent development of AF... So, in other words, if I treat hypertension, do I reduce then the risk of AF? Is that more or less what...? Um, yeah, well, there have been some studies where Should they... I be earlier treating? Yeah, That's probably the underlying again. the question, you know, yes. not wait too long with the hypertension. Yeah, because uh, all the drugs for hypertension, they, had, they, they have an impact on the RAS system. Um, so you also have an impact on the degree of fibrotic tissue. So at least that's one part of the uh, structural remodeling. Uh, it doesn't matter which drug you give, I think, but all the drugs affect that pathway. And there is one study where they actually measured the complexity of electrograms in, in hypertensive patients. And there they saw that if you have hypertension or a lot of fibrotic tissue, the degree of, of, of complex signals is higher. And also in animal models, they show that when you give anti hypertensive treatment, the amount of complex signals reduces. So it seems to have some effect on your structural remodeling and hence also on your electrical activation. So probably the substrate is a high pressure, the heart, blood pressure, the heart has to function, pump harder, that results in left ventricular hypertrophy. If hypertrophy comes, yeah. fibrosis in the ventricle, and it then... It induces in the atria because exactly. there's wall stretch. Exactly. And there it also but also increased LVEDP probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Indeed. So yes. multiple factors, but that all come together by long-standing hypertension and ventricular problems translate in atrial problems. Is yeah. that simply 
Uh, it's very simple. I think it's more complex than that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's one uh, possible uh, possible explanation, I would say. I thought you would say that that I'm not <laughs> thinking too complex. <laughs> <laughs> so another question that I have here: Has COVID or long COVID contributed to the pathologies that we saw? In other words, how does COVID long COVID relate with atrial abnormalities, atrial fibrillation, etc.? Well, I can imagine that COVID has an impact on atrial fibrillation or at least on the persistence of atrial fibrillation because COVID affects the atrial tissue. I don't think it's yet understood how it exactly affects the atrial tissue, but any structural abnormality makes you more prone to atrial fibrillation. And there are indeed reports that patients have more often atrial fibrillation uh, and more often have atrial fibrillation after an infection. Mm -hmm. uh, we also see that with if you have a pulmonary infection. Oh, yeah. And so the same for COVID. And um, probably when you have more damage to the atrial tissue and you already had atrial fibrillation, your episodes will become longer. Right. Important point also. Um, Another question, as part of public health measures, should we teach all persons to measure your blood pressure at young age and frequently thereafter? And if so, what young age? Oh, I think that's a very difficult question. Um, at the young age, yeah, how many hypertensive patients are there, for example, in puberty? There, I think it's not effective. Uh, when you go, uh, get older, of course, you have to check for your risk factors. And same goes for atrial fibrillation. And we all now have wearables where we continuously check our rhythms. And, but at what age, I, I think, is it uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit old fashioned? <laughs> and most people have. Um, and then, uh, they, they, then you can notice when your heart rate goes up. Um, yeah, but if you get older, your risk, particularly after 60, we know that the, the, the incidence of atrial fibrillation rises. For blood pressure, also, if you, if you have it in your family, then you should start, let, for example, at the age of 40. But I think that's for each individual at a different moment. Important questions and important answers that you give. Um, the last one about nocturnal arrhythmias and masks or etc. What do you think about that? Um, there is now increasing evidence that the uh, disbalance in this disbalance in your autonomic uh, nervous system plays an important role. Have you know that if you stimulate your ear, that it reduces uh, the amount of episodes you have. So some people have nocturnal AF; they wake up in the middle of the night and then they have atrial fibrillation. So there seems to be a role for that. But how to treat it at that moment, the, particularly the vagal AF? Yeah, there are some anecdotal, very old studies uh, on diso, um, disopyramida. Mm -hmm. um, that's yeah. a drug. Um, but yeah, for the rest, we don't have any much knowledge on the topic. So in other words, we know a lot, but also we don't know a lot we don't, yet. Yes, we don't that know enough. For a lot of research, but I think today was a great session. Um, thank you all for the outstanding lectures. And to everyone online joining, our next session will take place on 19 April 2023, 1700, by Dr. Thomas Mengden from Bad Nauheim. I don't know about you, but I had a great time. Yes. I think it was, it was extremely was exciting, wasn't it? It was indeed. It was very nice. <laughs> Thank you all for watching, and we see you the next time, 19 April, Dr. Thomas Mengden, Bad Nauheim in Germany. Thank you.